I think maybe the over-the-top dislike some fans exhibited towards Dark Souls 2 caused the developers to walk back on ideas that were genuinely better. Okay, I, 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 I could spend a good deal of this video defending Dark Souls 2. In fact, I'm going to compile a video looking at the central complaints about it. Um, and why all of them are wrong and lies from criminals, and I'm gonna put that up in a separate video a bit later on. Uh, when that comes up, I'll put the link here. So, okay, cool. Uh, back to Bloodborne. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mauler, and welcome to part three of my measured response to H-Bomber Guy's video, In Defense of Dark Souls 2. So far, we've covered a large portion of his perspective of the game, including health systems and enemy design. However, there is more. His video shifts focus from talking about PvP and bosses, and instead moves to talking about crowds of enemies and the focus system. The framing for this part of Harris's video will be in response to Matthew Matosis, who created a rather long video explaining the very complicated and extensive issues with Dark Souls 2. I've also heard the criticism that there are too many bosses that consist of fights with large groups, and this is proof of the game's poor design. Similar problems extend to other boss fights, which seem to follow the mantra, if you can't make it good, make it difficult by adding more stuff. This is Matthew Matosis. His Dark Souls 2 critique video came out just over a month after the release of the game in April 2014. It blew up somewhat on the internet, to the point that a lot of the times I see someone in person or online talking about Dark Souls 2, they're often using criticisms that can be heard in this video, and many who don't like the game will cite it as a source for their explanation of why. So this is where it all begins, and also where my video starts having three layers. This is going to become extremely complicated, and I will do my best to guide you through it, folks. Here we go. Comments that are from Matt will be presented in bold. Harris talks about how the bosses that consist of large groups will be evidence of poor design to many people. For me, this wasn't entirely the case. Despite spam being a strong pattern in Dark Souls 2 with both bosses and mob encounters, the game had moments where multiple enemy bosses were highly engaging and seemed as though they were put together with a purpose beyond trying to kill you. I actually found the three ruined sentinels to be a challenge in that you want to kill the first one as soon as you can, leaving a battle between the two in the main ground, since one of them is relatively easy, but far less so depending on the ground in which you battle them. This is an example of multiples in a boss fight testing your ability to manage terrain. Well, I mean this is a good example, there are bad examples. There seemed to be some level of purpose to the boss composition, this cannot be said for several other multiples multiple enemy bosses, however. The Prowling Magus and the Congregation turned the game into an embarrassment. What happens when you have one enemy that deals real damage yet has barely any health combined with a handful of terribly slow and ineffectual zombies at their side? Basically, it tests nothing new, whatsoever. You gain nothing. This is a roadblock boss meant to act as punctuation of the area. It's almost like they needed a boss in this particular area, so they just shoved a bunch of things together. Or, it's as if the boss was created somewhere and then placed into whatever they were currently designing. I mean, why is this well-kept church in the middle of a series of old spider-ridden caves? You could have removed the fog, the music, and the boss health bar, and this room would have made more sense. There are several zombies trying to claw at you from below, and a few mage-like ones among them. But they made it a boss fight to add to the ever-growing marketable list of bosses. It would be like making the Randy Spellcaster and the set of zombies in Undead Parish a boss. It doesn't make sense. But when the players realized they had spent this much time in the world without a boss, I imagine they were hell-bent on providing something, anything, rather than focusing on making those individual levels more engaging. This is strict proof that the developers are willing to throw several enemies from other areas together and slap a health bar on it. This is lazy, or at the very least, a rushed and poorly constructed portion of the game. It would seem that if they couldn't offer good bosses in these scenarios, they just settled and added more enemies into the area. That's the same as being challenging, right? Matthew and his statement about the mantra of Dark Souls 2 is very much on point. If you watch his original video, he mentions 11 different boss fights that use multiple enemies to manufacture difficulty, and how several of them are as lazily put together as the Capra Demon encounter from Dark Souls 1. This is a great strength about Matt's content, proving a rule that spreads from one game to the next, and that his perspective is based on the fact that he simply wants to enjoy the content and the consistency that he has defined. When you consider one or two shoddy boss fights, it is a blemish and an otherwise fantastic experience. 
but when you have an incredibly large amount of low quality nonsensical boss fights, it will have a damning effect on the game overall, or at the very least for this aspect. Next up, Harris says the people when criticizing the game will often use criticisms from this video from Matt. I find this interesting because I was the last person in my group of friends to finally complete Dark Souls 1 and 2. After I'd finished each game, we all came together to discuss the quality of the games. After a potentially long discussion, we all came to a similar conclusion about both Dark Souls 1 and 2. We all went through the games and the many aspects of design, identifying many of the choices in design that led to certain perspectives while relating back to Dark Souls 1 and forward to Dark Souls 2, and wondering why so many things were changed. Friends of mine had recommended a lot of channels on YouTube to explore, including Noah, Joseph Anderson, ACG, and finally Matt. Matt's channel was the only one I hadn't gotten around to yet. Then, sometime later, I saw In Defense of Dark Souls 2 and wondered whether it would be worth checking out the guy Harris is criticizing. Yes, that's right. Aside from random clips, Dark Souls 2 Critique was the first video of Matthew Matosis I actually watched from start to finish, and I was made aware of it by Harris. I have to thank Harris for responding to Matt here as it allowed me to find what I consider to be an extremely high quality critic on YouTube. I have since enjoyed many videos from him. I watched Matt's video in prep for this video several times and I was heavily impressed. He makes about one point per minute with evidence supporting it and language that can not only identify the problem but explain the effect it has on the player with references to From Software's previous work. I found it to be an extremely strong piece of criticism, well constructed and well argued. Matthew would honestly have been an inspiration to me had I found his channel years earlier. The point is, yes, many people probably did use arguments from Matt's video, just like many will now be using Harris's. This is completely normal, as our jobs as YouTube analysts is to explain things that others have trouble explaining. Unfortunately, a talking point being echoed isn't descriptive of its validity. That has to be taken case by case. Harris will be trying to tell us why Matt is wrong in his video. What we're going to do is fact check both of them and see what happens. Like I said, complicated, but I fully recommend watching both of these fellas' videos before continuing because it'll help you understand the entire series of arguments better. Anyway, let's do this. In fact, when asking viewers for criticisms that they would want to see me respond to, the bulk of them linked this video, and most of the people that didn't did so because they knew for certain I would have already seen this one by now. We're dealing with a piece of criticism that had, in its own way, quite a fundamental impact on discourse surrounding the game. The arguments got copied, repeated, referenced, and in many ways I think the prevailing dismissive attitudes towards the game's quality started to crystallise as a result of this video. That's not to say the video is literally to blame for negativity towards Dark Souls 2, but regardless, it is necessary that this critique be defeated and destroyed at all costs. So firstly, we have the anecdote about his audience asking him to respond to Matt. This is likely because Harris will fight the tide on a lot of established topics. He is an outspoken fan of Dark Souls 2, so the fans of the game in his audience would appreciate validation by the creation of a video in defense of it, and that would explain this entire ordeal. He sells it, however, as though people are asking him to cover Matt's video as a result of the video being inaccurate, which is yet to be seen. Next up, we have him admitting that Matt's video had a fundamental effect on the discourse surrounding the game, and I fully agree with this statement. Matt provided the tools, language, and evidence to people all over the world to understand the fundamental issues with Dark Souls 2, and thus made the conversation easier to digest and approach. I like to think I offer the same service with my in-depth analysis, pointing out every last detail to the makeup of a game to truly reveal what is under the hood. Perhaps not as effective, but within the same scale. However, Harris believes that Matt has poisoned the well, and people don't understand that he is actually lying. He says he must destroy and defeat Matt's video at all costs, which I would say is certainly a joke, but I imagine he does feel some kind of animosity towards Matt for tarnishing a piece of content he loves. This is very much like me and Joseph Anderson with Soma, but the difference is Matt supported his arguments with evidence, he understood the content. But I can still empathize with the ferocity Harris is feeling, but it is completely misplaced. The mechanics of the Souls games are built for one-on-one -on -one engagements, thanks to its slow attack animations which are uninterruptible once they start, and a lock-on camera which focuses heavily on a single foe. This early criticism is an interesting one. The claim is that adding more enemies into the game and also into some boss fights is a lazy attempt to increase difficulty, and that this is bad because Souls games are specifically designed to work best against single enemy encounters. So Matt opens with saying that the base mechanics in the Souls series is that of slow attacks that are uninterruptible once they start, and the lock on camera will focus a single target. The reason focus is important for the camera to be aimed at the target at all times is so that you don't lose them, and for your attacks to hit the target dead on without you having to aim it with the left analog stick, which can be very annoying and lead to completely missing the target. This system is best suited for single enemy encounters, as a 
among other things, it is more difficult to land attacks without focus, and if you have more than one enemy, then you'll likely leave yourself open for attack by focusing on one of them. Like, seriously? If you pay attention to the many times you will try and hit enemies without focus, I guarantee you will spot a series of attacks that simply miss when it feels like your attack was good enough. This, for the vast majority of time, will be solved by focus. Ultimately, you can work without it, but it is heavily supportive of the rhythmic gameplay that the Souls series is celebrated for. Battles with Dancer, the Fume Knight, Gwyn, the Penetrator, Sir Alon, etc. would be ruined if you cloned them and had to fight against two or more, resulting in selective use of focus. Conversely, with something like Ornstein and Smo, it is a tortoise and the hare dynamic encouraging you to pull Ornstein away from Smo, or use Smo to block Ornstein, depending on who you want to kill first. The fight gains its rhythm in that you wait for the moment that both enemies are vulnerable, and then cleave through the chosen target. This fight would be ruined if it was simply two Ornsteins or two Smos, as the bosses complement each other. It isn't strictly about the Souls games lacking the mechanics to enable multiple foe boss fights, or multiple foe engagements. It's about the context of each of these fights, and how they take advantage of the mechanics, or operate in a way that shows their weakness. Matt has previously said that he very much considers the Ornstein and Smo fight to be one of patience, and something that can be mastered. Unlike the Bell Gargoyles, where one of them came in at half health, this is a proper fight against two bosses at the same time. It is definitely one of the biggest difficulty jumps in the game, but as with a lot of things in Dark Souls, once you've played the game a lot, they're actually not that bad. When you're fighting two large enemies like this, the only way to consistently avoid damage is to wait for both of them to whiff an attack and then punish them. You can end up waiting on that for quite a while though, so if you want to make it through this fight properly, you need to try and be as patient as possible. Unfortunately, everything that I just said in terms of nuance within the mechanics is removed from Matt and presented by Harris this way. Adding more enemies into the game and also into some boss fights is a lazy attempt to increase difficulty. It isn't that simple, especially considering how Matt breaks it down in his own video. Watch the part that Harris cut out. In Dark Souls 2, the number of bosses with multiple enemies jumps to 11, 12 if we include Dark Lurker, most of which feel as lazily designed as the Capra Demon encounter. Rather than make the Freya fight difficult by giving her a challenging moveset, the designers just drop some random spiders into the battle instead. The epitome of this lazy mindset is the Belfry Gargoyles, a copy-pasted setup except this time there can be more of them active at once. This all might have been fine, except it doesn't play to the series' strengths whatsoever. This clip is between the two clips that Harris has provided. The reason that it is important to keep this part in is that Matt mentions several supporting pieces of evidence for his argument. First, that having multiple enemy boss fights is less preferable, if poorly designed, than the sole enemy boss fights and yet there are 11 in Dark Souls 2. This is because focusing on one target naturally means you have to gamble with the other target, sometimes being extremely difficult to see while trying to take an opportunity to deal damage. This is possible with Ornstein and Smo, however it is supplemented by the fact that Smo pretty much walks at a lumbering pace compared to Ornstein. Next he says they feel as lazily designed as the Capra Demon in that they either clone themselves or they add previously established common enemies to simply act as fodder and stagger you during the battle. He labels this is lazy. Now, we've already been over that extensively in part two, so there's nothing to prove there. However, he brings in two examples, that being Freya and the Belfry Gargoyles, while he's already mentioned the Congregation and the Royal Rat Authority. All are valid as examples of lazy boss design and are explained by Matt. He then finishes the part saying it doesn't play to the series' strengths whatsoever. He says all of that very quickly and fails to mention in detail the several other boss fights that also become plagued with these issues. But that's the downfall of a 50 minute video. You can't talk about all of it forever. It would affect the overall message. He isn't like me, where I drone on forever and ever and ever, referencing everything, like some faggoty scientists for video games. And that is another reason why these videos are so lengthy. This is very complicated. What happens now is that Harris ignores the criticism of Freya, the Royal Rat Authority, the Belfry Gargoyles, and the Congregation in terms of repeated assets, and the lack of actual difficulty beyond spamming, and instead focuses on the idea of crowd control, which Matt mentioned briefly compared to his specific criticisms. This would be misrepresenting the argument from Matt and creating a straw man. As for the Royal Rat Authority, Authority, Matt called it a crapshoot in which you will either kill the four supporting dogs or end up dying to them or their status effects. This is such a wonderful criticism because it is literally what happened to me in my first and second attempt. This is one for one the experience with Capra Demon and it is also bad, but Harris wants to defend pretty much every facet of Dark Souls 2, which means bosses like this get a free pass as well. 
Matthew Matosis is entitled to his opinion, and I respect that, but here's why this is a lie. There are absolutely ways of dealing with larger numbers of crowds. It just requires different behavior than how you normally deal with enemies when there's just one or two. Crowd control is a different skill than the one that you're normally required to test, but it's one that's worth testing and really isn't in previous games. I remember God Hand being criticized for having too many enemies for an engine that was claimed to only really work best in one-on-one -on -one fights. But you can look up people playing it and see there's plenty of crowd control, but not if you always play the way you do against just one opponent at a time. Pray tell, Harris, how does one respect an opinion by ignoring its context, changing its meaning, and then calling it a lie? From what I can tell, Matt didn't express an opinion. It was a statement of fact. He said this. The mechanics of the Souls games are built for one-on-one -on -one engagements, thanks to its slow attack animations, which are uninterruptible once they start, and a lock-on camera, which focuses heavily on a single foe. I don't know of anyone who would disagree that Dark Souls was built for one-on-one -on -one encounters, and multiple enemy encounters are much more chaotic and difficult to account for. Not that they don't work, just not something the system excels at like it does with one-on-one -on -one battles. Since many things can start going wrong, like layering or combos or locking the player in position which takes a lot of your agency away, you can still work with these things and account for these things, but they are not desirable positions to be in. However, in the most extreme circumstances, even this sort of thing can come from one enemy. Stunlocking combos are bullshit! Fuck! That stunlock is absolutely horseshit! The system doesn't account well for these sorts of things, and they would very rarely happen in single enemy encounters, so yes, the system is built for one-on-one -on -one encounters, yet allows for multiple enemy encounters that can indeed be engaging. Matt never says the game cannot support multiple enemies at once. And yet you say, as if to counter him, that there are absolutely ways of dealing with large numbers of crowds. I don't understand this response. Matt has made it clear that he can deal with these enemies. He is saying that they aren't well put together, and that the Souls games aren't built for them before single enemy encounters. You then talk about how crowd control is a different method of tackling a situation, which we are all very much aware of. Matt never said that it wasn't. You are arguing against an imaginary opponent here. But perhaps the most embarrassing part of your response is that you say crowd control really isn't in previous games. Yes, it is. Dark Souls is full of moments in the game where you will need to control a crowd and defeat them, whether it be scripted or natural. There are examples of three-person crowds to eight-person crowds to a level where you won't be counting because you'll be too busy rolling away and waiting for a slash. This is the exact same level of crowd control you will find in Dark Souls 2, except it's not used as often. Not to mention that there is inherent crowd control in several of the boss fights in Dark Souls 1. Being that of Ornstein and Smo, the battle with Pinwheel, Grave Lord Nito, the Belfry Gargoyles, the Capra Demon, and the Four Kings, all to varying degrees. If crowd control means that you have to account for more than one target and choose to eliminate a desired target first, then all of these instances not only count, but are classic examples. Harris has now ignored the main portion of Matt's argument while attempting to flip the script by claiming that not only is it a good thing to have elements of spam, but that it is a good thing that Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls do not have, which by the way, is also countered by Matthew Matosis during his video. In Demon Souls, the man-eaters were arguably the ultimate spike in difficulty. You got partway through the boss fight and suddenly there was two of them. It was a moment designed to induce panic in most players since they knew their odds of making it out alive just dropped significantly. In total, there was four bosses in Demon's Souls which included multiple enemies, the others being very mild in comparison to the man-eaters. In Dark Souls 1, there were six bosses with multiple enemies, seven if we include the Sanctuary Guardians in the DLC. This is yet again between two clips that Harris has presented. In the very first selection of responses, Harris has misrepresented the video in question and completely disrespected Matthew's intelligence. To finish this section, Harris talks about how people criticized God Hand for not having an engine that worked better with one enemy, yet people had fun with multiple enemies, once again missing the point of Matt's argument entirely, and bringing an outlying piece of anecdote to support his counterpoint to a straw man. Let's move on. Take the Prowling Magus fight, for example. If you want to kill one of the crawling undead littering this fight, 
Your eyes need to be taken off the casters at the back in order to lock on. So this is the next piece of Matt's video that Harris has chosen to respond to. Matt is saying that if you want to strike an enemy to the floor without losing vision of the enemies, the back line, you cannot use focus to do it. When I heard Matt say this first, I immediately thought to myself, well, you can just not use focus and slash the crawling enemies down regardless. Then I played Dark Souls 2 as part of my research, watch a friend approach this area, and he wanted to clear the congregation on the floor first because they were obviously the weaker enemies. His problem was that his weapon couldn't perform a light or heavy attack that hit the floor, and he had to use focus to aim the weapon down. Doing this sacrificed his ability to see the casters, and thus their attacks. In the Souls games, the weaponry is restricted to specific attack patterns. This means that as long as the hitboxes are tight, then you can easily miss certain targets. In that case, you use focus and the attack will be directed for you. Dark Souls 2, however, doesn't always change the elevation of attacks efficiently, and this can cause major issues. This is the most prevalent in Dark Souls Souls 2 when looking at nearly all weapons and trying to hit the Titanite lizards. These things are almost impossible to hit with a vast majority of the attacks with several weapons. The sad part is, focus doesn't help you get it either. You are not bloody serious. Unfortunately, this forces players with certain weapons to knock out the casters first, otherwise the camera's positioning will misbehave. Matt is trying to make use of the focus system in a crowd control environment to choose one foe, hit them down, and move on. But that very movement prevents him from being able to identify a threat very close to him because of the way the camera pans so heavily down, thus creating an artificial challenge. This is how Harris responds. Ah, you see, here's your problem. Matthew makes the supposedly obvious criticism that locking on makes it hard to see your enemy, so the fight isn't well designed, or fights against groups are inherently bad in this type of game or something. But why would you lock on? You see, the Dark Souls series has this amazing feature where, using the right stick, you can rotate the camera to show anything you want on the screen. You can manually control the camera yourself. When you think about it, his argument actually is that the lock-on system works best against single enemies. And he's right about that. But that's why you don't lock on in a fight against multiple enemies. Okay, so first we have the supposedly obvious criticism line that serves no purpose other than to try and demean Matt, which is fine, but it would be better if Matt had actually said that. Secondly, he says that Matt is saying locking on makes it harder to see your enemy, and that isn't well designed. This is not what Matt said, and we've been through this. He said that in this instance, the Prowling Magus and the Congregation, if you want to kill one of the crawling enemies, then you have to lose sight of the casters at the back. Now, considering all methods, killing the dudes on the floor while being able to see the casters is actually possible. However, if you want to kill them using focus, which he does specify at the end of the sentence, he is absolutely right, which is a fair criticism since almost all of us utilize focus regularly and he's presented it in his own video. Take the Prowling Magus fight, for example. If you want to kill one of the crawling undead littering this fight, your eyes need to be taken off the casters at the back in order to lock on. This isn't because lock-on doesn't work, it's because these things are so close to the ground that the camera pans directly down at them, neglecting that there are enemies in the back. That, if remained in view, would benefit the player, but without using focus, your weapon is far less likely to hit your target. Harris then says that Matt might mean to say that fights against groups are inherently bad in Dark Souls, which again is a tired misrepresentation, and we're not even minutes into bringing in Matt's video. He then asks, why would you lock on? As I said earlier, Harris does not know his game well enough enough. He doesn't know that there are several weapons in Dark Souls 2, including the S-Stock and the Rapier, that cannot strike these enemies with the standard light and heavy attacks and require focus to be able to hit them. You almost always have to use focus if you want to hit a crawling undead with a light or heavy attack using these weapons, and it'll drive your camera away from the enemies in the back. This is why you want to use Lock On. Outside of that, the basic argument of how to crowd control in Dark Souls is that you herd your enemies until there's an opportunity to knock one of them out, or several of them out. You focus the one, or swipe at the several. In that first instance, you use focus, both in and out of crowd control. There is plenty of reason to use it. Then Harris makes a sarcastic comment, essentially telling Matt that he fails to see the obvious solution. This is already the final straw for many people watching this video. The intense levels of smugness in Harris's video ruin the reputation this video holds as well as any respect one will have for Harris, who simultaneously respects Matt. This is the enemy design section, by the way, and we have veered off to Matthew Matosis's criticism of focus obscuring vision. Yes, I am criticizing his script management. Lastly in this section, Harris says you don't lock on in a fight against multiple enemies. That is not true, as Harris proves in his own video. If we can slow this down, he is under attack and uses focus to knock out one rat easily when he is given the opportunity. We have already seen several moments of Harris proving himself wrong in his video, but I will continue to point some of them out so that you can catch the most important ones. 
Arguably the main lesson you're taught as early on as the first real areas is that enemies are attacking from all over the place and you ought to keep your wits about you more than just pressing the button that focuses on one person and hoping for the best. This is a game that prides itself on expecting you to look where you're going even as far back as the first game, with the guy hiding behind the doorway and people hiding in corners even all the way over in Bloodborne. So Harris starts using some wobbly language again. He says arguably the main lesson you're taught as early on as the first real areas is that. Now the issue here is that you can't be counted by anybody if he says arguably. It means that he could argue that lesson is objective, but he won't. He just says it's possible. Lucky for me, I can prove him wrong anyway. The first lessons you truly learn in the first real area would be in things betwixt on all of the tutorial stones. Because if real means something that provably exists as guidance, then the tutorial counts. But if it means anything but the tutorial, then it could be the Forest of the Fallen Giants where you battle an ogre first, or on the way to the Shaded Woods where you'll have a series of one-on-one -on -one battles with testicle men because you won't have the fragrant branch to breach the statue. Or it'll mean you battle the Hyde Knights in a one-on-one -on -one in Hyde's Tower of Flame, or maybe you saved up and bought the Cat's Ring and went down to the Grave of Saints and fought a bunch of rats. These experiences don't teach you to keep your wits about you, they're all about very different variables and very different players, where many of them may or may not learn different things, one of which could be keeping your wits about you I suppose, but that's as arguable as many other possibilities. The fact that you've whittled down Matt's playstyle as pressing the button that focuses on one person and hoping for the best is so unfair. Just, yet again, not remotely what his point was. You then say the game prides itself on expecting you to look where you're going as if to counter an argument that nobody made. Not to mention that if you slow down Harris's clip, he cut it just too long and shows that even he, in the battle that he apparently learned to not use focus, used focus. The lock-on system is a tool to be utilised carefully, just like every other ability and mechanic. Matt found the lock-on function was bad in this scenario, and concluded that it was a flaw with the game. The challenge in this boss fight, like with the rats, is to avoid getting swarmed and put into a bad situation, to keep track of yourself and navigate carefully. If you locked directly onto one of the enemies, you would have a problem, and that means you don't do that. Okay, Harris, you open here with telling Matthew Matosis that the lock-on tool is to be utilized carefully. You're telling Matthew fucking Matosis that there are elements in the game that need to be utilized carefully. This is why people are accusing you of being smug, by the way. It's this sort of thing where you use incredibly condescending language while misrepresenting one of the most respected Dark Souls critics on YouTube. But it gets worse. Matt found the lock-on function was bad in this scenario and concluded that it was a flaw with the game. No. Matt is criticizing one of the 12 boss battles in which there are multiple enemies, and how in certain instances the lock-on feature doesn't operate in favor of the player as it would in others, thus concluding this boss battle in particular, as well as certain other ones, to be poorly designed in relation to the base mechanics of the game. Matt's criticism of the game as a whole in this section of the video is that there are too many boss battles with multiple enemies as an attempt to create artificial difficulty and that they create the issues he is currently explaining. Comparatively, what you said, Harris, is yes another straw man. Finally, you boil it down to a simple instruction. Don't do that. In response to people trying to use focus during the Prowling Mage's boss battle. Would your advice for my friend playing with the rapier be, go get a different weapon? Let's continue. Dark Souls 2 uses fights like this and a generally different sort of level design to teach you that in this world, sometimes focusing down on a specific individual is a mistake. Matthew didn't like Dark Souls 2 as much because he didn't learn this lesson and kept trying to play it the exact way he played the previous two. Okay, this is getting worse. The first thing Harris says is that Dark Souls 2 uses fights like the Congregation and the Royal Rat Authority and a different sort of level design to teach you something. Before we get into what he claims it teaches you, what does a generally different sort of level design mean? This is very vague. This is the most vague description of something I've ever heard. Generally different sort? He doesn't develop that. He lets it sit that way. Anyway, he says that these vaguely defined things teach you that, in this world, sometimes focusing down on a specific individual is a mistake. This is not a lesson from the terribly designed rat boss in specific, or the lazily slapped together mages boss fight either. It is a lesson in strategy across a huge amount of media, not just a particular boss fight, not just Dark Souls, not just video games. It is a highly established concept. They say that if a man goes through life with his battle visor down, <laughs> He, he can often be blind to the enemies at his side. I believe the term is tunnel vision, and it's about focusing one target and ignoring others at your own cost. This is not a concept that Dark Souls 2 is pushing, it is literally in everything. Don't focus hard on one enemy. 
This shit is in Space Invaders, for God's sake, Harris, but I think you of all people know this. The issue for you is trying to justify a series of awful bosses. This is made clear by the follow-up comment. Matthew Matosis didn't like Dark Souls 2 as much because he didn't learn this lesson and kept trying to play it the exact way he played the previous two. You're telling me that Matt didn't know that when you have multiple enemies on screen that it is not wise to attack one alone and ignore the rest. This happens in Dark Souls 1, and you will use focus to chip away at the crowds. This is a blatantly false conclusion, and it is only meant to humiliate Matt, to try and define that Matt is someone who doesn't know how to play Dark Souls 2, and this is why we shouldn't listen to him or his criticisms. He also invokes the time you fight against the two dragon riders, and there's a cute little clip I want to show where he locks onto one and then has to angle himself precisely so he can see the two of them. The twin dragon riders are another example of this. You want to avoid attacks from both of them while periodically damaging one of them, but in order to do so, you need to lock onto one and position yourself in such a way so you can see the other. Okay, so you say that Matt is using a cute little clip, implying that he is now presenting his evidence in bad faith or forging footage for his points. This, among the previous examples, is why you have gained the reputation of being selectively insufferable. Matt says, you need to lock onto one and position yourself in such a way that you can see the other. Matt would be wrong if he is saying this is the only way to be able to position the camera to see your enemies. He would, however, be right if he wanted to utilize the benefits of the attack lock on focus. What I am saying is that players use focus to zero in their attacks onto enemies, and without it, you can miss very easily. So if Matt wants to lock onto Dragon Rider, then he has to sacrifice a view of the other enemy. This results in being unable to account for the projectiles. The reason this is different to the congregation is that the Dragon Rider is very fat and mostly a stationary enemy, so you're not going to miss him by doing your basic strikes. Regardless, that is all he is saying, that in this fight the lock-on works against the player as a result of the positioning of the enemies, which is a problem in more than one fight during Dark Souls 2 and does indeed occur in Dark Souls 1 as well. This is not the series playing to its strengths which is what this entire section was all about in Matt's video. This clip is meant to show how bad the lock-on system is in two-person fights, and therefore how poorly designed this fight is for putting this guy all the way over there. But the thing is, you could just not hit the lock-on button. You could just not do that. You can aim the camera wherever you want. You can still dodge and attack, you know. I looked back over the footage of me doing this fight, and I didn't lock on at all until one of them was dead and it became a good idea to completely focus on one enemy. This naturally occurred to me because this is how Dark Souls 2 teaches you to play. Harris says this clip from Matt is meant to show how bad the lock-on system is in two-person fights, when in reality this is Matt's section on criticism of bosses. He is saying that this boss doesn't play to the series' strengths, which are the focus system and the slow, meticulous combat. This is evidenced by the fact that you cannot use focus to aim your attacks while also being aware of your enemy, which is important to many players because of the difficulty it sometimes brings to hit the enemies without focus. Then you say that Matt is claiming that the fight is strictly poorly designed, which he never said. It's not in the clip you provided, nor is it in his video. Matt has a very strong structure in his videos, and with Dark Souls 2, he moves from the topic that Dark Souls 2 is slowly becoming iterative by focusing on the theme of difficulty and death in Dark Souls, You can practically hear the developers laughing at your expense as she says this. They're basically saying, we made this game really hard, that's what you wanted, right? He then references examples of this. It feels to me like difficulty was a big focus in Dark Souls 2, which is a crucial misunderstanding on the part of the new directors of this game, probably helped along with some pushing from Namco, who have enjoyed playing the difficulty card for marketing purposes since before the release of Dark Souls. As soon as you get to Medulla, there's even a counter tracking the number of deaths. You can also go online and see a full breakdown of the ways people have died. The most obvious way this has been misunderstood, however, is with the boss fights. The point here is that Matt believes that they wanted to make the bosses and random encounters difficult at all costs, even if it means positioning the enemies that were counter to the focus system that was in place. That is what he's referring to with the Dragon Riders, but now Harris has twisted the analysis to mean that the lock-on system doesn't work. This is another straw man. Harris has seen the entire video from Matthew Matosis. He would have edited these pieces together. We know that he's doing this on purpose. And it results in Harris simply saying, you could just not do that. So what about the players who need focus to assist their aim? What about the the situation with the piercing weapons. This is Harris's nuanced response to that criticism. You can aim the camera wherever you want. You can still dodge and attack, you know. Insufferable. 
Harris then says he personally didn't lock on at all until one of them was dead, which is wonderful, but Harris makes the mistake of saying Dark Souls 2 teaches you to play this way. I have to be clear here, games can try and teach you how to do things in many different ways, I went over this in my guidance video criticizing Mark Brown. The point you need to consider is that you have to be blatant in your evidence of the developers giving lessons. What the lesson Harris is describing here amounts to is, focus doesn't work here, therefore the game is telling you not to use it, as opposed to the truth, and that is that the way in which these situations are built prevents the player from being able to utilize focus in ways they could have had the bosses been designed differently. Focus is not inherently a tool you cannot use in crowd control, that is ludicrous. Not to mention that you still haven't defined what crowd control entails. Is it more than one or five or ten? No idea. I honestly think the mechanics and the way they're utilized in the first two games has gotten so ingrained in people who liked those two that it makes them play weirdly in games that work slightly differently or have different kinds of challenge, and this strikes them as a flaw. So Harris says he thinks that the way the mechanics are utilized in the first two games has gotten ingrained in people's heads, but the criticism here isn't on the game as a whole. It is about several of the 12 boss fights that Matt pointed out. The fact that they run counter to the systems in place and create more difficulty in relation to that. Matt isn't saying that the focus system doesn't work at all in Dark Souls 2. This would once again be a straw man. Not to mention that he remains vague on the topic of how the mechanics are utilized differently in Dark Souls 1. He simply says, the way they're utilized. What does that mean? Are you referring to crowd control again? Because that would still be as inaccurate as it was moments ago. As far as I could tell from playing both of these games, the intention of making use of slow and meticulous mechanics while dealing with single or multiple enemies is prevalent throughout both games. But Dark Souls 1 shows a lot more signs of crafted encounters. Dark Souls 2 seems to, as Matt put it, lack that level of design and simply adds more enemies to the fray to make it more difficult. It would seem that Harris explains that aspect away by saying the game is slightly different or has different types of challenge. Again, he doesn't specify what he means by this, he is simply crafting this world where the poorly designed areas of Dark Souls 2 can be explained by saying they test different things in the player. To try and show you guys how you can flip this, we could do the exact same thing for Dark Souls 1. I could argue that the Bed of Chaos tests your patience, and Capra Demon tests your immediate reaction time as well as management of small spaces. They are still poorly constructed regardless of what they're testing. I got some criticism on my last video that it's wrong to say it's possible to play a game wrong, and there's a lot of ways of playing Dark Souls, and they're all equally valid if that's how the player wants to do it. And yeah, kinda, but all I can say is I can definitely see why Matthew Matosis and other critics had a less good time with Dark Souls 2 if this is how they approached it. This looks a whole lot like playing the game wrong and blaming the game for it. I still do really bad in this fight though. Note to yourself, just g cut away from this quicker in the final edit. Also, we need to edit out the part where I say this, please. Harris is of course referring to his Bloodborne analysis in which he makes the conclusion that playing with a shield isn't fun. I watched this video with excitement after seeing him beautifully describe the issues I shared with him in Fallout 3, and I was mortified by the blatant lack of understanding of Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, and 2, and Bloodborne within his video. The rampant lack of evidence-based arguments supporting bizarre conclusions was beyond. It is literally wrong to tell someone that they are having less fun playing with the shield. I don't know why Harris enables his ego to make statements like this for him. One of his strongest pieces of evidence is that a friend went back to the other games after playing Bloodborne because he realized he didn't have to play with a shield. Anyone during a serious debate would use the phrase anecdote and then demand an actual point. But Harris sees this as a linchpin to his argument, which is a real shame because that's not how debates work, or how language works. What resulted was a series of commenters correcting Harris's use of language to better represent reality, and he didn't appreciate that. Though it would appear that he has learned his lesson here by admitting there are many ways of playing Dark Souls and they're all kinda valid. Only he didn't learn his lesson because he completely backtracks on that statement in the one that follows, claiming that the way Matt is playing the game looks like playing the game wrong. He is still stubbornly in the camp that you can play Dark Souls wrong and he doesn't explain this in any way. Is it morally wrong? Legally wrong? Is the person's level enjoyment not considered in this metric? How can someone possibly play a game wrong? 
This isn't a matter of opinion, you're not making sense. Not to mention that playing with a shield is still something that numerous people find fun, and several people are more comfortable with than without. In addition, many people will be using focus during crowd control in order to snipe off outlying enemies or to direct a swing to hit multiple enemies. Basically, Harris has a narrowed viewpoint of his beloved game and how you are meant to play it which is shields down and focus off, while Matt is just trying to make clear that the systems in place and how the mechanics behave naturally with several boss encounters can have contentious results. Not the game as a whole, just very specific examples that make for funneled experiences. But because Harris has just told the audience that Matthew Matosis was playing Dark Souls incorrectly, the atmosphere of the video is now a little bit controversial. But he softens that blow with self-deprecating humour to add to the perception that Harris is your average Joe, who is just as bad at the game as you are, so you can trust him. And that kind of thing makes all of this fun. Matthew is still trying to use the lock-on mechanic in fights, even as late as the Watcher and Defender bosses, and he's still using a shield. Aw, oh, bless. Someone really liked the previous games and tried real hard not to unlearn what they learned there. And now we've crossed a little bit of a line. First of all, using the lock-on in Dark Souls 2 is very much a viable tactic during the early game, all the way until the end game, regardless of your enemy encounters. It focuses your view and your attacks on the enemy you want to hit. This is definitively valuable in many circumstances. You've not proven otherwise, you've simply stated the opposite while I can show several scenarios in which it is useful. This is my magic run against Throne Watcher and Defender, and I used Focus. I don't have any compunction about saying that I'm pretty damn good at the Souls games at this point, and using Focus to zero in on my attacks worked just fine in Dark Souls 2. This is a friend of mine's playthrough using Focus, and he is now a veteran of playing each game in the entire Soulsborne series several times. He knows how best to play them, and yet, he uses Focus. This is another friend of mine's playthrough using Focus, and he is someone who has a massive amount of experience in both Dark Souls 1 and 3, knowing a very large amount about builds and speedrunning pathways, nailing bosses with very challenging settings. He uses Focus in multi-boss and multi-enemy fights. I think you may be getting the point here. You don't need to stop using Focus the second there is more than one enemy. The mechanic itself is far more nuanced than that. What I have shown you is three experienced players using it to their benefit, but I'm sure people watching knew about this already. Secondly, in Matthew's video, he clearly states that the Throne Watcher and Defender fight is an example of the camera working well with focus. The problem is about the focus on multiple bosses to forge difficulty and how you are left to simply wait for opportunities to strike with many of them. Even during engagements where the camera works well, such as the Throne Watcher, Looking Glass Knight and Ruin Sentinel fights, the gameplay suffers heavily from the multi-boss setup. You need an extreme amount of patience to get through any of these bosses in a safe manner. Matt isn't at all saying that multi-boss fights do not work. You may all remember a particular one from Dark Souls 1. It worked as a clear challenge, but as Matthew lamented on his perspective of Ornstein and Smo in his Dark Souls commentary, he made it clear that if they turned up more than once, it would be considered a detriment to the systems at hand because of what is tested in the player. When you're fighting two large enemies like this, the only way to consistently avoid damage is to wait for both of them to whiff an attack and then punish them. You can end up waiting on that for quite a while though, so if you want to make it through this fight properly, you need to try and be as patient as possible. It makes for a good highlight, but it certainly wouldn't be a highlight if every battle was like this. It's one of these things that needs to be done in moderation. If you listen to his work, Matthew is very consistent on this point. The point here is that he listed three bosses in which he thought it worked versus several he thought it didn't and listed his own reasoning for it. Why was this amount of important context removed from the video? I imagine it was in order to make Matt look unintelligent. On top of that, you very condescendingly say, ah oh, bless, and that Matt didn't unlearn what he learned in the other games. Not only is this petty, but you don't even specify what lessons you're talking about since crowd control is in Dark Souls 1, and using focus when you need it is clearly in Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. You've invented a nondescript lesson that nobody else has been made aware of, and you're pointing and laughing at people who you deem haven't learned it. As I have said previously, this kind of thing is why people aren't going to listen to you. First you cut out imperative footage to his argument, then you change his argument while ignoring the framing of the section of the video, then you treat him like a child. I'll be going through your entire video, and to be honest, Harris, even this is not enough to sway me from watching your videos because I find them so bloody entertaining. But you do realize what you're doing, right? This kind of criticism sheds light on the critical perspective that approached the game in the first place. 
Players who went into the game expecting it to be exactly like the previous ones inevitably did badly in these sections and seemingly blamed the game for it. I consider myself to be an experienced and talented Dark Souls 1 player. Whether people agree is up to them, I suppose, despite that apparently meaning I shouldn't use shields, focus, or criticize multiple enemy boss fights, I still do. I, at this point, also consider myself a talented and experienced Dark Souls 2 player, and I have been using what I learned from Dark Souls 1 in several aspects of the game. I use very similar tactics as Matt while also agreeing with his criticisms. I don't consistently die in these boss fights, in fact they're usually quite easy. Similarly to Matt, I simply believe they're poorly constructed, and also similarly to Matt, I have provided proof. I mean, fucking hell, Harris. A mohawk. I'm sorry that your absolutes are falling apart. Joseph Anderson, a critic who put out three videos about Dark Souls in late 2015 and was much less negative about the game, similarly doesn't use the lock-on feature in many of the fights he shows in his video, and like me, he fought most of them without using a shield either. I'm sorry. Are you saying that because Joseph Anderson didn't use lock-on and enjoyed Dark Souls 2, it proves that people who use it are playing it wrong? and thus causing their own lack of enjoyment? How could you possibly confirm that this is how From Software wanted to spend their time in Dark Souls 2? As for the shields, by the way, wanting players not to use them doesn't really explain why there's a shield vendor before you have access to the weapon vendor, does it? You are provided access to purchasable shields before purchasable weapons. That sounds like the game pushing you towards a style of play if you ask me, but I would never say that because it is simply an option for the player, not in any way is it forced guidance. Besides, since when is Joseph Anderson even reliable? Have you seen his video on Soma? The man always has interesting opinions, but he doesn't put the work in. He plays games once or twice, makes sure to complain about that, then makes definitive claims about subjects he can't possibly make. Soma isn't really a horror game. It's not scary. He also does the thing you do, where he will literally say this isn't or is fun, definitively. But the fight isn't that fun or challenging. It is so annoying to listen to people tell you what isn't fun. Regardless of that, were you even telling the truth, Harris? The claim is that Joseph Anderson played through Dark Souls 2 with no preference for the shield. Now because I'm thorough and fair, I'm going to go watch his three videos and fact check. They'll wear light armor so they can move quickly to avoid attacks and have faster roll animations. Or they'll find the heaviest shield in the game that has the least amount of stamina loss when you successfully block a hit. Looks like Joseph used plenty of shielding. Not only does Joseph Anderson have several extended clips of using the shield, but he laments that using the shield can get you in trouble in several sections of the game and punishes the player for a specific loadout. Basically that Dark Souls 2 isn't as prepared for all builds. It will funnel players to certain actions. Joseph Anderson is actually very positive about the use of shields in his video. I recommend you all check it out for context. Also, Harris, did you really pay attention to Joseph's video? He criticized a lot of the same and in in fact, more of Dark Souls 2 than Matt did, and yet you fail to mention this at all. The Estus Flask is your primary source of healing in Dark Souls 1. You have limited charges, and the only way to refill them is to return to the bonfire and rest. But this makes all the enemies in the level respawn in the exact same way as if you had just died and were sent back to the bonfire. This is the best mechanic in the entire series as far as I'm concerned, because it brings everything together. When you first start to explore an area, your flask charges dictate how far you can get. You're new and will make many mistakes, and that's what those charges represent. How many mistakes you're allowed to make before you run the risk of being kicked back to the bonfire. The inclusion of life gems destroys the careful balance that the levels needed to maintain with your Estus charges. He seems to think that life gems ruin the balance, which has been something you strongly disagree with, but I don't remember a single reference to Joe. He does not agree that they supplement the Estus as a form of pushing players on. I mean, why would he when humanity's clearly functioned as that far better in terms of balance? No, oh, I'm sorry, you said you don't count them as healing. Uh, my bad. Whether you are a fan of the larger connected world, or the shortcuts and discovering paths within each level, it's clear that this is a huge downgrade from the first Dark Souls. Well, it will be coming up, but he considers the lack of shortcuts and interconnectivity a strict downgrade. I already know that you disagree with that heavily. The boss here is similar to Quelag from the first game. It's a scorpion instead of a spider, and hasn't had the same level of care put into her attacks. Having to find solid ground after she burrows is an okay twist, but this is mostly another easy fight that doesn't have much going for it. The Duke's Dear Freya is a terrible encounter. You simply run from head to head, slashing once or twice, and occasionally killing a spider. They have the potential to swarm you, but that's about it for the challenge in this fight. The optional part leads to one of the worst bosses in the entire series, a giant rat dog thing with his four little poison rat buddies. Even understanding how multiple combatants was meant to work, this fight is just awful. 
you can get poisoned easily and, even if you do beat them all, the battle against the dog isn't that fun. It feels like a more random version of the last giant. The Prowling Magus in Congregation feels like a room full of normal enemies that have been given a boss health bar for some weird reason. The bosses in this game are, generally speaking, weaker than the original. Oh dear, all those bosses you've already mentioned being great at breaking up the monotony? It looks like Joseph doesn't like a lot of them. Fighting this guy is the first and best example of a big problem with the game's combat, hitboxes. Both you and enemies will sometimes land an attack that you had no business landing, or will clearly hit something and deal no damage. The item he gives you is necessary to enter the memories of the dead giants in the first level. These areas have a vague time limit that is never shown to you. They're also all pretty bad, and this is the weakest part of the game as far as I'm concerned. NPCs like this are broken in Dark Souls 2. In this case, he has a dark-based spell that does so much damage that it can kill some characters in one hit. It also has a very short cast time, and he's capable of turning on the spot to aim it. Other phantoms also move incredibly quickly for the weapon and armor they're using, and in the case of the only DLC boss that is outright awful, well, we'll get to that. $25 for some revamped enemies and a few graphical upgrades that bring it closer to the quality first advertised in their reveal trailers. This goes beyond greed. Yeah, so it looks like there's a whole lot that Joseph heavily criticized about Dark Souls 2 and Scholar of the First Sin. More power to him, but I have to be honest here. It is rather an extreme lack of integrity that because you and Joseph Anderson share a perspective on whether or not to use lock-on, you omit the information from his video that contradicts you. Conversely with Matt, because you disagree on several points, you misrepresent him and actively try to humiliate him regularly. Please hold yourself to a better standard. In in the same manner that shields are fine, but not if they engender passivity, the lock-on system is a great mechanic that can accidentally engender a reliance upon it. Also, Monster Hunter, a series many regard as very similar in a lot of ways, has basically no lock-on functionality whatsoever, and the subhuman criminals who love Monster Hunter seem to do just fine using it to see the enemies however they want. That's not to say Monster Hunter wouldn't benefit from having one, but if it did have one, it would probably be something to use sparingly, much like in Dark Souls 2. So, interestingly here, Harris opens with, Shields are fine, to secure his argument. He knows that it isn't reasonable to say that you shouldn't be using shields if you want to have fun, despite that being the point of his Bloodborne video. He then adds, but not if they engender passivity. Unfortunately, the flavor text on a shield in Bloodborne has now become a meme for Harris to reference every time he wants to criticize shields. This is highly inaccurate because of the nature of Bloodborne compared to Dark Souls. There is no switch to be flipped. You don't suddenly behave aggressively in Dark Souls and end up enjoying it as much as you enjoyed Bloodborne. I mean, I'm sure there were some people, but it's not a definitive rule. You simply move and expend action faster in Bloodborne to reflect the game's nature. A shield would be highly out of place in Bloodborne since the mechanics actually reward you for being on the offensive, while Dark Souls as a series will punish you for being headstrong and trying to brute force your way through if you aren't very skilled at it. You cannot use the flavor text of a pitiful plank shield in Bloodborne to describe the action of using a shield in Dark Souls as a series. This is absolute nonsense. There is nothing passive about blocking damage and striking back. If you choose to never fight an enemy, then you aren't really playing at all, as opposed to playing passively. Then you imply that one can accidentally become reliant on the lock-on system. This could be true, as it is true to become reliant upon any mechanic. For example, using the plunging attack. Many were reliant on the plunging attack from Dark Souls 1, but they altered it in Dark Souls 2. Now it does extreme amounts of damage. Well, sometimes. I mean, sometimes it just does a bit of damage. Or it doesn't do much of anything at all. Hell, it can completely miss and end up staggering you for a short period of time, basically rendering you helpless and punishing you for even trying it, regardless of how accurate you were. The plunging attack, among other things, are highly reliable in Dark Souls 1. Only once in all of the playthroughs combined from myself and friends have we ever seen it function differently than intended, and I think it may have been just a bug. In Dark Souls 2, it's broken, therefore people shouldn't rely upon it. You are right, but that doesn't make the system good, it makes it pitiful. The fact that a mechanic will sometimes work for you versus others where it will not, is not evidence of it being nuanced. There are so many ways to rely on something working and you fail to utilize it regardless of functionality that I don't even see the point of bringing this up here anyway. Yes, using lock-on when you shouldn't can get you into trouble. I am sure that we, and Matthew, are aware of this. Then you bring in Monster Hunter as an example of a game that is similar to Dark Souls and does not require a lock-on system. Unfortunately for you, I was a huge Monster Hunter fan back in the days of PSP, and the lack of a lock-on made everyone play the game with the patented claw hand. 
to be able to move your character, move the camera, and access all of your abilities at once. If the game had a lock-on system, you can bet that many would have been using it, but you make that argument yourself, so again, you're really just saying that you should be careful with focus, which doesn't contradict Matt's point. Again. Matt simply stated that fights with multiple enemies do not take advantage of what the series was built for. The biggest joke here, however, is that I know that you agree with him. There was a little quote that I hung on to for a very long time. You may remember it. Earlier in the previous part, when we were talking about your favorite fights in the series, you mentioned the Pursuer, the Lost Sinner, the Looking Glass Knight, Velstat, the Fume Knight, Sir Alon, the Burnt Ivory King. For those who don't remember, he was saying this in defense of spamming similar bosses, which was one of the earliest criticisms the game received when it was released. Now, Ignoring the fact that half of his references are from the DLC, and they weren't even released at the point of those reviews, making his defense almost moot, he makes it clear that these fights are what the Souls games are vessels for. But hey, to make sure I'm not missing the point of that bit, let me play it for you guys. Dark Souls 2 has a lot more of this kind of fight than the previous two games, and more than Bloodborne also. And this, I must stress for me, it, it, this is my opinion, is a gift. The Pursuer, the Lost Sinner, the Looking Glass Knight, Velstat, and that in the DLCs, the Fume Knight, and Sir Alon, and the Burnt Ivory King. In my opinion, these fights are what the Souls game's mechanics are vessels for. This is what the game should be built around. Notice how all of the fights are against one enemy, except for the occasional time the Looking Glass Knight summons an NPC. This is fascinating though, because of what he says here. In my opinion, these fights are what the Souls game's mechanics are vessels for. This is what the game should be built around. That is almost exactly what Matt's point has been for this entire video. Except he used the term built for, rather than vessels for. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why you have to redraft your script, otherwise gaping plot holes begin to emerge in your narrative. Besides that, you know a boss that is considered terrible by most if not everyone from the DLC in Dark Souls 2 that he so handily avoids mentioning? The Double Ava clone boss? This thing was incredibly frustrating to even reach let alone kill, and it was a complete rehash of a previous boss that was by no means a memorable one. Just like Dragon Rider, they cop out and repeat their designs for lack of content to fill the holes with. Why do I bring this up? Well, let's bring in another cross-reference from his Bloodborne video. Finally, the big monster boss fights. Souls games are bad at these, in my opinion. I get it, a lot of people like the gaping dragon and think he's cool and there's a, you know, they're interesting looking, but in my opinion, they're not that great to fight, which is the important bit. There's a common complaint, which I'll refer to as the dudes in armor argument, that Souls games feature too many enemies that are just dudes in armor. But in fights, monsters and the big, cool, weird enemies don't react in a manner that makes sense to me as a player. Human enemies respond when you hit them with your sword, but Sif, for example, doesn't seem to even flinch most of the time. He apparently doesn't like monster fights compared to men on equal footing nor does he feel that the Souls games do them well. He also doesn't like it when bosses don't react to you. Now, monster boss fights are one thing. Bosses that don't react to your hits is another thing. Both of these things occur in Dark Souls 1. There is no denying it. But let's take a look at something for a second. How many monster bosses are in Dark Souls 2? Well, there's Scorpion S. Nashka, the Rotten, Ava Ludenzalen, the Royal Rat Authority, the Covetous Demon, Medusa, Nashandra, Old Iron King, the Guardian Dragon, the Ancient Dragon, the Slumbering Dragon, the Giant Lord, the Demon of Song, the Last Giant, the Duke's Dear Freya, the Executioner's Chariot, the Royal Rat Vanguard, and of course, Oldir. That's a huge amount of monster bosses compared to Dark Souls 1, and yet he doesn't repeat this criticism from the previous video because it would ruin the atmosphere of defending Dark Souls 2. The second issue of bosses not responding is also the same. You can chop off tails here and there, you can even chop off the rotten's arm, but none of it is more extensive than the reactions you'll get out of the enemy bosses in Dark Souls 1. And again, no mention of it in this video aside from saying the bosses break up the monotony. The point I have now made twice is that Harris has been flip-flopping on principles when they stand in the way of the current narrative, and that is something that we need to keep an eye on. Regardless, you end your statement there by saying that you are to use the focus system sparingly in Dark Souls 2, and you say it as if it's a fact. This is simply untrue. If you want to land your attacks with the most accuracy, you will use the focus system to guarantee the strike as the Souls series has a tendency to demand accuracy. If you want to never lose sight of your enemy, then you will use focus to zero 
zero in on the target. Many players will be using focus throughout their playthroughs, and if you do not believe me, ask people who play the game. As long as one person says that they did while completing the game with relative ease, as I did, then I guess your theory doesn't hold. Also, it's worth remembering that this type of boss has been present in Souls games for a long time. You might remember, I don't know, the Phalanx, uh, the first real boss in Demon's Souls. It's a fight about balancing the interplay between the actual opponent and the numerous creatures that break off from it and act independently, threatening to surround and overwhelm you. Then, right after, there's the Tower Knight boss fight. Geez, the first two bosses in the first game in the series, and both of them use mechanics Matthew Matosis concluded are inherently antithetical to the core of the Souls games. What, did the developers not realise how they game worked. Okay, so you say that this type of fight has been present in the Souls games for a long time now, despite only referencing two, and they are both from Demon Souls, and they are both meant to counter Matthew Matosis in some way, despite him clearly showing in more ways than one that he has a strong preference for Demon Souls. You put forth a premise very solidly in that you identify what aspect could be tested with fights like this, but then you erroneously assume that that works as a counter to Matt's point. First of all, what makes you think that the Tower Knight boss battle and the Phalanx are indeed the same as the Royal Rat Vanguard? Is it simply that there's more than one enemy? Secondly, what makes you think that two battles in one game equates to 13 in another? Thirdly, what makes you think that Matt believes that these two fights are well designed? Perhaps he doesn't. Furthermore, what makes you think that this is an intended final outcome for the design of the boss by the developers, just because it's in the game? I can tell you for certain that Lost Isolith is not as From Software originally intended it to be. These things are mysteriously missing in your counter-argument, but perhaps the most egregious piece of missing information is that which I have already shown. Matt is not saying this is antithetical to the core of the Souls games. What he actually said was, The mechanics are built for one-on-ones, which is actually what is taking place in the Tower Knight fight and the Phalanx fight. In your own footage, Harris, you once again provide your own counter-argument. You are performing individual battles in a multi-enemy battle overall, and you are using focus during it too. I don't know if you remember your previous point about single enemies. And let's not forget that you actually agree with Matt that one-on-one -on -one encounters are what the Dark Souls games are vessels for. In the Tower Knight battle, you need to be mindful of projectiles while focusing one target at a time, and in the Phalanx battle, you need to look at your own positioning while focusing on chunking down the enemy. As Matt previously said, these games can support these fights, they are simply not where it is strongest, which is something you agree with, you've forgotten. The vast majority of popular and critic opinion on the best fights in the series are those with one opponent. Hell, yours was Artorius, which is a fantastic choice, by the way. However, the fight would have been awful if there were two of him, as I have alluded to already. Matt has made this extremely clear in his videos, yet you are attacking the straw man relentlessly. And if you're interested in listening to him share his perspective, then watch his video called The Lost Soul Arts of Demon Souls. I do not think that Harris genuinely believes that the Royal Rat Authority and the Tower Knight are in any way similar bosses, but he is not going to explain it further. He'll simply say this. If I lock onto the archer, I can't see the Tower Knight unless I stand here. I can't use the function designed for focusing on one person and see everyone else. What, did the B-team design this game? Ha 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 ha. Once again, you are making it more and more difficult to listen to you when you make extremely weak arguments punctuated by condescension. And as for the B-team, we're going to explore that in the future. Attacks also lock on to an unnecessary degree. When a boss goes to do an overhead attack, it will usually track the player up until the very last moment before impact. When Matthew Matosis makes this comment, in order to make an example of a superior fight, he cuts the footage of the Adjudicator, the least memorable fight in the entire Soul series? I forget the Adjudicator exists every time I play Demon Souls without fail, and then I go, oh yeah, this guy, and I kill him on the first try and forget about him again. His attacks go for where you used to be 10 minutes ago. No aspect of this boss should be the model for how fights should work in Souls games. So next up we have Matt making the claim that the tracking on enemies in Dark Souls 2 is far more significant than in the previous games. Harris then responds by saying Matt uses footage of the Adjudicator as an example of a superior fight. Curiously, that footage doesn't show up. The clip doesn't show up. But why? Why not show us, instead of telling us about it? This video is long, so it doesn't hurt to add a few more seconds, surely. You see, Harris had to be careful to skip over the context of this section, because it includes a couple of pieces of information that frames this very differently. 
Lucky for you guys, I'm one of the longest form content creators on YouTube, or at least in this genre. I, I make long stuff, so I'll happily show you it, basically. Attacks also lock on to an unnecessary degree, far more than in previous installments where enemies usually had movesets with their own weaknesses and strengths. When a boss goes to do an overhead attack, it will usually track the player up until the very last moment before impact, even if this means the boss has to spin around like they're standing on top of a record player. I can only speak for myself, but I was hoping to see less of this kind of stuff, not more. Bosses should have movesets which don't rely on tracking the player in such a cheap, simplistic way, and it's notable that big bosses in Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1 usually lack this kind of lock-on, or only used it during part of the wind-up in order to compensate for their powerful moves. Harris wants you to think that Matt believes that very little tracking is the answer, while in reality, Matt has made it clear that he wants balancing. He accepts that tracking to an unnecessary degree has existed in the previous games, while pointing out that tracking is a strength for an enemy. It may have strong tracking, but it will usually have weak health, or weak damage, or perhaps even weak movement. He laments on the idea that enemies look like record players when they spin to remain in full tracking of the player. But perhaps the most important part to his statement that Harris left out is that he said, I can only speak for myself, which may leave the idea to the audience who have not seen Matt's video to believe that he is stating all of this to be fact. He is not. Matt then moves on to double down about the balancing argument, and while I do not consider strong tracking to be an issue in itself, I certainly agree that balancing is always important, and when you have a massive enemy that hits like a truck, it is nice to have a compensation like weak tracking, for the sake of mixing up the fight while providing some weaknesses. Basically, how they handled the Adjudicator and several battles in Dark Souls 2. This is an example of Matt's video being butchered by Harris, and it is very unfair for anyone who hasn't seen the original for comparison. Harris then talks about how the Adjudicator is far too slow to be a threat, and he always forgets the fight. This is a clear anecdote once again, but more importantly, Matt has already spoken about balancing and how he feels that it works in relation to the Adjudicator, which is omitted from Harris's video. Honestly, not many people actually tell you what they forgot to strengthen an argument, since it is so simple to lie about. It could mean many things, including a lack of attention to the content. But more to the point, irrelevant anecdote. He then says that nothing about the boss should be the model for other bosses, without providing any sense of a strong argument aside from its weak tracking. This is highly entertaining to me, as the tracking on several bosses in Dark Souls 2 is absolutely abhorrent, and potentially the worst in the series. I think it's time we talk about Dragon Rider. Dragon Rider is one of those repeated assets I talked about earlier. But Dragon Rider has one key flaw that we all need to talk about. He is clinically depressed, and regularly takes his own life. He is doomed in the land of Drang Lake to simply find ways to end his own existence, because it has become so painful. He is suffering, and he needs help. One like equals one prayer for Dragon Rider. Seriously though, Dragon Rider has some of the most embarrassing AI in the history of the Souls games. His tracking will not allow him to catch up to you once you get behind him. It's like a turtle that's fallen over, and besides that, he kills himself regularly. This is far worse than the Adjudicator. I can't really over-exaggerate this. Hey, everyone who's watching this video, the next time you play Dark Souls 2, try standing behind Dragon Rider and walk opposite to his movements. Then watch him have an aneurysm in attempts to try and find you. Not only that, but his health bar is pitiful, especially for the clone in Drang Lake. Oh my god, what the fuck? <laughs> and let's be honest, the reason they stuff him into places is to simply add more enemies. Because making the current enemies more engaging would have been far too difficult. For example, in the Shrine of Amana, having him sitting on a narrow pathway makes it clear as to what his purpose there is. And I will die if I run to the sides here. That's, that's nice. That's the fun aspect. <laughs> <laughs> Oh look, another Dragon Rider. The reason I bring this up is that Harris is having a fun old time criticizing an enemy like the Adjudicator, as well as this in his Bloodborne video. The Darkroot Basin also has the most dumb boss in the game, who has two attacks they do over and over, and which basically miss even if you're standing still. But Harris doesn't seem to have a problem with the five instances of what is essentially a mentally challenged robotic man in a suit, who can't for the life of him resemble a threat until they put him in a specific position that still ends up killing him. Not to mention the mobility 
variety of bosses like the Covetous Demon, the Giant Lord, the Rotten, the Ancient Dragon, Vendrick, the Last Giant, Old Deer, the Old Iron King, and even the Demon of Song. They have moves that are so slow, they don't keep up with you at all. However, from a perspective of balancing, I could definitely argue that some of their moves need to be that slow. Some of the elements of tracking are perfect compared to their other statistics. That's what balancing is. The simple fact is that in previous entries in the series, circle strafing enemies has been an easy way to cheese a lot of the game. Because the enemies focus in on you more, guess what? You actually have to dodge some of their attacks now using timing and knowledge of the right direction to move based on judging how the enemy's moving. Now we've switched gears entirely from tracking in a select few cases to circle strafing instead. Bit of a jarring change because Mathematosis never said you couldn't circle strafe the enemies in the game. And the Rotten, the boss that Matt was using in the beginning of his clip, is actually very easy to circle strafe, which any player would be more than aware of having played these games. But yes, the argument is now on circle strafing. Harris claims that it has been an easy way to cheese a lot of the games in the series previously. This is blatantly untrue. Strafing, and by extension circle strafing, is a strategy in many third and first person games that gives you flanking advantage when the opponent is attempting to attack you and misses. This is an intended form of attack for many battles in Dark Souls. In fact, Joseph Anderson talks about this in his Dark Souls 2 critique video. It is about risk versus reward. The lowest risk and the lowest reward is to block an attack in terms of knuckling up, then perform a light or heavy attack at the risk of it being completely blocked or slash them for a significant amount of damage. The middle of the road is to try and strafe around with the shield up or down and dodge an attack to get ready for a backstab or several slashes which can cause much more damage. And finally, the highest risk and reward would be the parry riposte, meaning that you take a very strong risk in that you could very well be hit in exchange for a critical strike. This is a risk versus reward system just like the healing. It is present in every game in the series, including Bloodborne. It is not evidence of cheesing an enemy like shooting them from out of bounds. It is something players use as a form of battling the opponent. But yes, Harris moves on to say that dodging attacks now requires knowledge and timing to move in response to the enemies. Backed up by his comment here saying, Pictured, Matthew Matosis cheesing a black knight in the first game because circle strafing wrecks them. And then, Pictured, Matthew Matosis fighting an enemy that doesn't get cheesed by bullshit. This is hilariously wrong. All right, you can't circle strafe in this game. The dead. <laughs> yeah, I literally circle strafed her. Circle strafing is a glaring flaw in Dark Souls 2 all the way to the bloody end game boss. But more importantly, this little section here is very petty at the expense of Matt once again. So let's go through why. As you have been seeing in the background, both before and after Fortia humiliated Nashandra by walking, I have been performing circle strafing as a means of cutting straight through to an enemy, and Dark Souls 2 contains some of the most mongoloidic enemies in the series. Now that you're aware of this, please go back and enjoy all of the clips, because it's just gorgeous evidence. Evidence in its simplest form, a staggeringly large amount of enemies fall prey to circle strafing in Dark Souls 2. No, circle strafing does, does, doesn't work at all against these guys. <laughs> and this whole thing gets even worse. I am sure this piece from Harris is out of frustration. If Matt is claiming that tracking is monumentally unfair in Dark Souls 2, then the reasonable response would be that tracking is present throughout the series, and we would need specific examples of bad tracking. In addition, bad tracking is something that simply means you have to delay that dodge to the last moment instead of being rewarded for dodging very early. However, instead of that, Harris has implied that Matt uses bullshit cheesing to kill enemies in Dark Souls 1 and that he was punished for trying it in Dark Souls 2. This amount of telling people how they're playing the game wrong is once again something that Harris does not enjoy hearing from the Souls community himself, yet he will tell people that humanities aren't for healing and that they shouldn't be using shields and that they should be using focus when he says they should. The argument on circle strafing, however, is not over. A lot of the fights Mr. Matosis, if that is his real name, uses to make examples of this apparent horrific problem 
actually show him mistiming a dodge, or dodging in the direction of the swing. I don't think this demonstrates what he thinks it's demonstrating. Bosses all over the series lock right onto you as their attack goes off. This happens because on some level the game is about learning how and when to dodge instead of just spin in a circle around someone so they can never hit you. The amount of lock-on enemies have in this game is only a problem if you don't know how to dodge attacks. I honestly think this footage speaks for itself. So this is the last part of the section on dudes in armor, which I am sure you can see has devolved now into trying to humiliate Matthew Matosis instead. I think it is time to explain how he has tried to do that. Harris Fist makes a joke about Matt's pseudonym, which, I mean, you often call yourself Harris Bomber Guy, so I don't understand that jab at all. He then says that the real problem that Matt has is mistiming the dodges from the attacks of the enemies. So I need to explain something here. The reason why I don't mind tracking is that it means that you need to dodge at the last moment as opposed to being given a bigger window. This is harder, but it is undoubtedly more challenging, and will sometimes be present in most intense boss fights. As far as I'm concerned, every boss in all of the games has moments of strong and weak tracking, but it's more about the experience as a whole with that boss, rather than one particular move. Being chased in a big circle with one move is frustrating because when you are behind an enemy and they have lifted their weapon you don't theoretically imagine they're going to spin around and hit you, yet it does occur in all of the games. Albeit with different enemies, sometimes less annoying or noticeable, sometimes more. Matt is saying that it is far more extreme in Dark Souls 2 than the previous games, and I agree with him. Though I didn't mind it all that much, it is far down the list of issues the game has. If we now understand the premise of tracking then, you will now understand that Matt isn't saying he is being hit because he dodged correctly and the game used tracking to get him, he is saying that it is far more difficult to dodge because of tracking, and you should save strong tracking for enemies with some form of weakness as opposed to giving them good tracking, good health, good movement, good damage, and good abilities. Again, balancing is important as he has made very clear. Matt is admitting that he is missing the window on the dodge, but that window itself is too small. Harris has gotten the complete wrong idea here and is now making some embarrassing statements about the footage Matt used despite Harris having contradictory footage throughout his own video, as we've been through. Following that, Harris then states that bosses throughout the series have had this ability, though only moments ago he said that Dark Souls 2 is the one that finally requires the player to use skill and knowledge to overcome the enemies instead of circle strafing. Not to mention that he already played the clip where Matt accepted this happened in the previous game, so I have no idea what this argument assists. Then, Harris mistakenly attributed the inability to dodge strong tracking attacks as the inability to dodge in general. These two things are very different as one requires a dodge once the enemy has lost tracking, while the other requires it mere moments before their weapon hits the target. One of these things is far more difficult than the other. As a finisher, Harris says this footage speaks for itself, and that once again, snide comments are very hard to listen to, especially after digging through these arguments. But for the sake of the clarity that Harris is not providing, I am going to play the unedited footage that Harris used to prove Matt is using tactics from Dark Souls 1, and becoming frustrated that he can't cheese them. Listen to what Matt actually says in full. Regular enemy attacks do the successive amount of tracking as well, even when it's completely unnecessary. Take the turtle armored enemies for instance. Despite their massive suit of armor, they'll follow the player 360 degrees on any of their attacks. The sad thing is these enemies have a built-in countermeasure for any player who gets behind them, so there's no excuse for them to be constantly facing the player. The challenge here should have been to try staying to the side of the enemy without getting too close to the front or the back. Instead, they just require the same tactics as every other enemy in the game. So as you heard, Matt is once again talking about balancing. He is fully aware of how these enemies work and is lamenting on the fact that they punish the player for approaching behind and in front. He says that they follow you to 360 degrees and that the challenge should have been to attack them from the sides as opposed to waiting for them to finish their attack and then go in. Only to wait again and then go in. Rinse, repeat, fall asleep. Which is the very bottom of the barrel approach to enemies that Harris has been talking about being removed from Dark Souls 2. But once again, Harris is keeping this away from his audience in order to paint a more supportive picture of the narrative that Matthew Matosis doesn't know what he's talking about. Matt knows that he can't circle strafe these enemies, the problem is that there's nothing else you can do. In Defense of Dark Souls 2 isn't a very strong video when considered so far. For a detailed analysis based on the idea of giving people strong reasons to appreciate Dark Souls 2, it has amounted to insulting Matthew Matosis and trying to convince us that Dark Souls 2 is good because it's better than Dark Souls 1, which is such a waste of energy. 
Honestly though, despite everything I just said, this section still falls apart regardless. The defensive measures cannot be seen in many enemies at all, despite Harris implying it's throughout the game. I personally found it to be only prominent in the turtle and ogre enemies. The issue, however, with the turtle is that you bait the countermeasure out and then exploit the enemy over and over again. The issue with the ogre is the exact same. How is this any different from the tactics with circle strafing? The fact that he referred to that as cheesing means that this has to be cheesing as well. And it works so well that I employ it whenever I approach these enemies and it honestly feels like they didn't expect people to figure this out. Is this considered cheesing? The repetitive and easy to manipulate AI? I don't think so. It is just like circle strafing and backstabbing. It is a strategy and it works, as I imagine was intended. Obviously I can't know. The final issue I have, however, is that there are examples of what I call balked tracking in Dark Souls 2, times where it would seem that there is something very odd going on in terms of enemy design. Watch this. How did you miss me? He even had tracking there. I was a done fucking deal, but he missed me. What I am almost certain is happening here is that the Looking Glass Knight is preparing a move that is going to slam his sword down and fire a projectile at the enemy from the tip of the sword. Now the sword itself has a strong amount of tracking that I dodged by being out of range. However, this obviously means that I have no choice but to be hit by the projectile that comes next because it will be fired in the same direction as the sword, right? Well, not quite, because the tracking system made the projectile assume that I would be further to the left at the point of leaving his sword, and so it fired at where I would have been at normal walking pace had I not been healing with a life gem. This obviously slows down my movement, and the Looking Glass Knight had obviously not been coded to account for that, and simply attacked where I just was with the sword, and where he thought I was going to be with the projectile. Only I was nowhere near there. This resulted in his attacks being skewed at about 45 degrees, and shows a strong instance of the game's obsessive tracking that doesn't serve to reward the player for dodging. It is essentially cheating in order to hit the player. I actually found the fight itself to be pretty smooth, but this is the kind of tracking I imagine Matthew was talking about. Balked tracking. In total for this section on why dudes in armor is awesome, Harris first made the point that dueling individual opponents on equal footing is Dark Souls at its best. Despite the fact that most if not all the fights he referred to, including NPC invasions, are that of enemies with far more health, stamina, speed, tracking damage, and access to materials with no caveat that PvP is a mess. He then said Dark Souls 2 has more of this kind of fight than the previous game, despite avoiding the topic that Dark Souls 2 has far more ridiculously underwhelming and downright embarrassing bosses to fight. There were several anecdotes about how Dark Souls 2 is his favorite experience of all the games, which was absolutely irrelevant to the analysis. Moving forward, he talked about the Hyde Knights and the design being underappreciated without looking deeper into the gameplay associated with them and the boss fights that aren't duels being great at breaking up the monotony, but avoiding talking about how terribly simple these fights were. He then took a complete deviation from his through line and began talking about the focus system while criticizing Matthew Matosis. This went on for some time and proved nothing more than his goal, which is to discredit Matthew in the hopes that he will make people respect Dark Souls 2 more, which is a completely flaccid endeavor, considering that Matthew Matosis is well respected in the critic community and Harris probably has many fans of his within his own audience. That would about sum up as far as we've gotten. As for the length of individual videos and why this one was so long compared to any video I've made previously, I am trying to keep these things within their own topics and this whole extensive response thing is totally new to me. As you've seen, this is something I've never done before. But I want to be extensive, I want to be fair, and I really want to give Dark Souls my best shot. So consider this an experiment. I hope this series has entertained somebody so far, you guys. Please let me know what you think, and if you enjoy this kind of content, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. There's no way I'm not getting shot with an arrow. Unless he just completely mi- <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Ha <laughs> <laughs>